Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. So, I'm Ricardo Fluffy Pony. You may know me as Fluffy Pony. Uh, my handle on Twitter and Reddit is Fluffy Pony ZA. The ZA is for Z Afrikaans Republic, South Africa, where I live. Um, and uh, there's my GPG key, which I, or my GPG fingerprint, which I tend to splash everywhere because that kind of identifies me. And if I ever start signing stuff with another key, then get worried. And today I'm going to talk to you about how to boil a frog. Okay, cooking lessons with Ricardo. So I don't know if you know the adage of, or the story about how to boil a frog. If you have a pot of boiling water and you throw the frog into it, the frog jumps out because it goes, oh, you know, the water's hot. But if you take a pot of cold water, put the frog in, and then bring it to boil, the frog doesn't know until it's too late. Okay, it's pretty grim, but we are boiling frogs, and I'm going to explain why. You see, we have a shifting landscape, and the changes have been mostly for the better. We started off with this amazing thing called cash, which was great. We moved on to things like IOUs, little slip of paper that says, I owe you some money. We then had checks, we had wire transfers, we had SWIFT, we had credit cards, we had transaction switching. We, and then we had regulation and we had KYC and AML, know your customer, anti-money laundering. But all these things have been great because it's been an improvement in convenience. And we like convenience as individuals and as humans. What we may have forgotten as boiling frogs is that this has meant a decrease in privacy. That's not so great. And in fact, if you go back to, as, uh, as Rick pointed out, you go back to cash. Cash is a fantastic system. It's a private system, and we have lost that. But why financial privacy? I mean, do we care? Because today we have people that are happy to give up their privacy on Facebook and tell Facebook all their details as long as they can still play Farmville. And so we are used to giving up our privacy for convenience. Now, reasons why we might want some financial privacy are, for example, without financial privacy, we can be assumed guilty. Because, yes, this transaction you did, that's dodgy, so it must be you and you must be guilty. There's no assumption of innocence. That's an issue. Uh, there's other things like if you're a company and someone can see your transaction history, so they get access to your banking re records, for example. They can see who your, your suppliers are, what your profit margins are, what you're paying your employees, all sorts of sensitive information. How about unintended leaks through purchases? You make a donation to the church that you belong to, and your boss finds out, and he says, well, I don't like that. And now your work environment becomes difficult. Wealthy people can be targeted by criminals because the criminals can figure out what they earn and how much money they have and where it's stored instead of through direct observation like you have a Ferrari in the driveway. Unwitting participation in crime. So maybe you're involved in a crime because of some financial transaction and you don't even know. And next minute the police are knocking on your door. That's an issue. Advertisements based on spending habits, which is probably my pet hate. I shouldn't need to see an ad based on something that I bought on another site two months ago. I've already bought it. I own it. I don't need to see an ad for it. And I certainly don't need to see related ads. And then, of course, one that is quite irritating is no plausible liability. There's the transaction record. You must have made it. And you can't turn around and say, well, maybe it was my next door neighbor. And then one that's specific to cryptocurrencies is, of course, minor censorship. So. A miner can go, well, this particular transaction appears to come from that dodgy, fluffy pony guy. I'm not going to mine it. And if enough miners don't mine it, then maybe my transaction never goes through. Now, oftentimes when I speak about transactional privacy or financial privacy, people go, oh, but it's incompatible with the law and we need the law to protect us, which is true to some degree. The thing is, when we were using cash, then the law still worked. Okay, so the law works, no problem, because policemen can still go and do good old-fashioned police work. The taxman 
can go to your house and see that you live in a mansion and you have two Ferraris in the driveway and say, but you're only declaring earnings of $10,000 a year. Something's wrong. He doesn't need to see all of your transaction history to be able to see that. He can pitch up at your house. The other thing is that cash, for example, was fantastic as an opt-in system. So an opt-in transparency scheme is somewhere where in order for the taxman to know or, or the police or whatever to know about a transaction that you did, they have to go to you and knock on your door and say, so we heard that you paid this amount of money to this person. Did you or didn't you? Okay, that's opt-in. Opt-out is what we currently have, well, it's not even opt-out, but what we currently have at the moment is that they don't need to come and ask you. They can go ask the bank and then they can see, oh, these are your transaction records. Not so great. So, like I said earlier, and like Rick alluded to as well, cash is the ideal system, or was the ideal system, because now we have the war on cash. And cash is great because, firstly, it's extremely private. Secondly, it only relies on your OPSEC. Now, OPSEC is operational security. And when we say that it only relies on your operational security, what we mean is, if I pay somebody cash, and they don't know my real name, then some, someone can go and bust them and be like, oh, you've received this payment. Who was it from? And they can go, I don't know. He didn't tell me his name. He was a pony. I don't know. <laughs> Whereas oftentimes with our current transactional system, and even with Bitcoin, they can go and there's this knock-on effect because someone else can reveal you through lax operational security. And then, of course, cash can only be revealed by the owner. So they can come knock on your door and say, how much do you have under your mattress? And you can say, much, many notes. Come count them with me. And of course, cash is perfectly fungible. Now, fungible is a, is a cool little word that economists like to use to mean one thing can be perfectly interchanged for another. So cash is perfectly fungible because I, if I have a 50 euro note and I come to you and I say, please give me two 20s and a 10, you're not going to go, oh, sorry, I don't like 50 euro notes. You know, it's the same thing as 220s and a 10, it's a 50, it's the same thing, you don't care. So, wouldn't it be cool if we could have a fungible digital currency, a cash-like system, okay, where two things can be perfectly interchanged, no problem. And when Bitcoin was released, and Bitcoin is really more than just cryptography, it's an exercise in very clever incentives, it's an exercise in game theory, and it's a combination of all of this and economics. Then we thought, here we go. We now have a new hope for fungible digital currencies because Bitcoin is secure. That's proof of work. It's literally secured by the electrons in the universe. It's also decentralized. There's a low barrier to entry. You don't have to spend much to run a node. You have to have an internet connection and a bit of disk space. It's also peer-reviewed. It uses old, established cryptography. Some of the cryptographic concepts in Bitcoin have been around for 20 years. And then, of course, it's efficient. Small transaction sizes, very efficient to verify. In terms of performance, you can actually, on a Bitcoin node, on a reasonable CPU, uh, you can definitely verify tens of thousands of transactions a second. The problem is it's not fungible. And that's a systemic issue. It's not that Bitcoin was never designed to be, it's just that that wasn't one of the system goals. But of course, we are Bitcoin users and we want financial privacy. So we kind of go, what are our options? And in fact, is traceability a problem in the first place? So the way to view traceability as regards Bitcoin is to view it like a puzzle. The blockchain is a puzzle. And somebody who's trying to figure out where transactions are going to and coming from, they also view it as a puzzle. So what happens is they start filling in blanks. And as they fill in blanks, they go, well, this kind of looks like it could be a thing. I don't know what it is. I have no idea yet. But I'm filling in blanks and I'm starting to guess. And maybe it's a rocket ship. No, OK, it's not a rocket ship. And maybe it's a, I, I still don't know what it is. Okay, so there's a dude with a coin putting, oh, oh, now I know what it is. It's a piggy bank. And that's the problem with the blockchain in general, is that things stay there forever. An attacker 
is not bound by time. As metadata gets revealed, they can start to associate things and they can start to guess what's in between until eventually they get the end result of the puzzle. But Ricardo, who cares about stuff that happened three years ago? Nobody cares. The police don't care. Except when they do. So this happened in Germany. You can see the date, 2016, 10th of March. Some guy got sent a letter and got fined for buying drugs on Silk Road in 2013. Okay, three years later. Now, again, I mean, great, so the police bust some dealer and they figured out that some dude bought some drugs from him three years ago. The larger issue here, the systemic issue, is that he does not have the ability to say, that was not me. Maybe it was my neighbor who shipped stuff to my house because the police have the transaction records and they can track it through to an exchange he used or whatever. So Bitcoin in its current state is not fungible. It's never going to be able to provide the, the privacy that we need as is right now. And being able to track stuff many years down the line is a problem. So what can we do? Well, there have been some things that have been suggested and this was probably the earliest suggestion was just to use a centralized mixer. And a centralized mixer is some dude running a computer somewhere and you just send Bitcoin to his dodgy site and you hope he doesn't steal it. And a bunch of other people send Bitcoin to his site and then you get your amount back, but hopefully from a bunch of other people, hopefully. The issue there, apart from the centralized trusted issue, because the dude is going to steal money from people eventually, is that you might end up with somebody else's Bitcoin and that person might have committed a bunch of crimes. And now the police come and knock on your door and say, hey, buddy, so we see you bought a bunch of cocaine. And you go, no, it wasn't me. I used a mixer. So that's an issue. But okay, I mean, there are other things that have been suggested. For example, there's been uh, stuff like pre-mixing. So using something like CoinJoin or like a centralized mixer, whatever it is, you mix like with a whole bunch of people and then you end up with very small denominations in your wallet. And now you have a bunch of these tiny denominations. Now you need to pay something. So you go to a coffee, a coffee shop and you pay for a cup of coffee. And then you go down the road uh, to wherever, and the drug dealer, and you buy some drugs. And now, because it's coming from the same wallet, the coffee shop knows that you went and bought drugs, and the drug dealer knows you went and bought coffee. So that's an issue with pre-mixing. And then, of course, there's advanced cryptography, really like super high, in insane stuff, which in all honesty probably will be the future. But because it lacks peer review, and because it's so new and so like insane, it's kind of risky to use. And a lot of the stuff is untested. Um, we, I was at a conference a few days ago where we were talking about post-quantum cryptography and isogenies and stuff like that. And the guy said to me, he's, he's got a, a, a master's in post-quantum cryptography, and he said he can make claims about post-quantum cryptography, and he can tell me that maybe this will work and maybe the other thing will work. But until we have a quantum computer to test it on, those are just claims. So a lot of the really high high tech insane cryptography remains untested and will remain untested until 15, 20 years down the line when it's being peer reviewed, people have tried to break it and so on. And then we have CoinJoin. Now CoinJoin is pretty much the best of a bad bunch. And if you are using Bitcoin and you want to at least achieve some modicum of financial privacy, you need to use CoinJoin. And the way CoinJoin works is you go, I want to send a payment of 2.3 Bitcoin to this address. And a bunch of other people go, I have 2.3 Bitcoin and I will assist you with this. And then everyone connects together and they create a transaction where all their different 2.3 Bitcoins go in and then they get their 2.3 back and one 2.3 from someone goes out the system to the final destination. Now that's great because you have this amazing property now of being able to say, oh yes, somebody bought crack cocaine with this, but I've got plausible deniability. Could have been one of the 10 people I mixed with. So if you want to use CoinJoin, I consider this as a best practice is to use JoinMarket. JoinMarket is relatively new, but it's actively developed. It's focusing on things like being decentralized. 
Um, people are also incentivized to mix because, or to provide mixing liquidity because you earn fees for providing that mixing liquidity. And if you want to send a transaction using Join Market, you're paying a small fee for the privilege of doing that, and then that gets paid out to all these liquidity providers. The downside is Sybil attacks. Now, Sybil attack, a uh, Sybil is not my aunt Sybil. A Sybil attack is where the people you're mixing with are all the same person and you don't know. They appear to be different people. And now they're all involved in the mixing transaction with you and you go, great, I'm private. And meanwhile, it's one dude sitting behind a desk at the cop shop going, ha, ah, now we know who he is. So Sybil attacks are unfortunately a systemic risk with, um, with CoinJoin in general and not something that anyone can solve right now. Kind of the only solution is to mix with people that you personally know and that you know aren't cops or you hope they aren't or, you know, aren't working for Chainalysis. Um, and then, of course, there's tainted coins, which we've spoken about, where you might end up receiving coins that were used in a, I don't know, darknet market heist or something. If you want to get started with Join Market, there's the GitHub. So the GitHub's kind of cut off, but <laughs> it's github.com forward slash join market dash org. And they've got a repo they call JM Binary. They have a little GUI. It's really neat. And that is kind of the best that you can do right now with Bitcoin. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Monero because Monero, we wanted to go try that digital cash thing again because, you know, the Bitcoin thing isn't really working out as far as digital cash goes. So a quick overview, Monero um, is not new on the scene. It was launched in April 2014. Um, it has an unknown creators, an unknown cryptographer, and an unknown guy that launched it, which is cool. He's like our Satoshi Nakamoto, except not as nice. <laughs> it's privacy-oriented and utility-driven, which means that our focus is on privacy, but also on making it useful, not on making it artificially grow in value. It's not based on Bitcoin's code. It has proof of work like Bitcoin, but a different uh, algorithm. And it has no limits on the supply, which some people go, oh my God, it's no limit on the supply. But the reason for that is to retain mining incentives into the future. And that's a discussion you're welcome to have with me afterwards. Um, the project structure, there are a bunch of people involved in the project. It's not just me. So there's the Monero core team consists of seven people that the community allows to be stewards of the code. We obviously cannot govern the network, that's impossible, but we can provide a governance structure for the repository, the code repository. Then we have contributors to Monero Core, the developers, and uh, at the moment there are about 33, 34 developers or contributors, of which like 10 or 11 are active. We have contributors to Covery, which is our I2P uh, router project and then we have the Monero Research Lab which consists of four, three or four um, academic researchers, PhD um, cryptographers and mathematicians and then we have the Monero community and the Monero community is huge and they do everything from Q&A's on Reddit to updating Twitter to all sorts of other cool things. So that's kind of the project structure. Now, just briefly, how Monero works and how it differs from Bitcoin. If you imagine this is the Bitcoin blockchain, it's easy to trace a transaction through because there's always a one-to-one -one relationship between them. And yeah, it gets a bit more, a bit more complicated with CoinJoin, but that stuff's always there and traceable forever. Now, the way Monero works, if you imagine this to be the Monero blockchain, is a transaction appears to come originate from a bunch of old transactions, old and new. And you can't actually tell which of those is the real originating transaction. And so, obviously, I mean, this is kind of, you know, there's only four that it could possibly be, but you've got to go find out, like, who is behind those four transactions, and then go knock on their door, and then say to each of them, was this your transaction? And they can go, nope, wasn't me. And there's plausible deniability. Obviously, you know, four is kind of small. You can have a hundred, no problem. And the advantage here is where CoinJoin requires you to actively participate in a particular transaction, this can be done completely offline on an air-gapped computer as long as it's got a copy of the blockchain. So we spoke about opt-in um, reveal mechanisms, and Monero has one of those. It's called the view key. 
The way the view key works is you can provide your view key to, for example, an auditor, and an auditor can then see your transaction history for your Monero account, although you can create another one that he doesn't know about. And he can then, he can see all of this, but he can't spend your funds. Now that becomes really powerful from a transparency perspective. Can you imagine a government department where they publish their view key and everyone can go and see like, you know, the funds that they're receiving and oh, you know, yes, some bribery and corruption happening, but nobody can spend the funds. Okay, what about charities? Same thing, they can publish their view key and then you can go, oh, oh, with this charity, you know, what is it doing? Why is it spending $10,000 on a car? Why, you know, a month? So there's stuff like that. Um, there's also uh, revealing it to selected parties. So instead of revealing it to the world like a charity would do, you can go and give your view key to the tax man and the tax man would be able to go and see your transaction history, but again, not spend your funds. Okay, where as at the moment, they can say to your bank, hey, this guy owes us a lot of money for tax and the bank goes, sure, yeah, no problem, take it. Okay. Defending against advanced attacks. Now, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know. There are a lot of capabilities of state level attackers and even script kiddies that we're not aware of. So Monero has to defend against them. Now, the basis for this, and this is really important, everything we do in Monero assumes a worst case scenario. Now, the worst case scenario, from my perspective, is some guy goes and uses Monero to buy something, whatever it is. Maybe he goes, he lives in some weird country and he uses it to buy a religious emblem. And next minute, his life is on the line. Literally, he's going to be put to death based on this. I don't want to personally be responsible for some guy being put to death. So everything we do with Monero, every system we design, every scheme we come up with, every privacy enhancing thing we do is on the assumption that someday someone's life is going to hang in the balance. So if we pay that much attention, or if, if we treat everything with that much care, then at least we can go, we did our best. Okay, so that's the basis for it. So we, for example, use a different elliptic curve to, to Bitcoin, and I don't want to get into massive details here, but it provides an alternative to things like ECDSA, which could have issues, and to SECP256K1, which apparently do have issues, or so certain people think. So we use a different elliptic curve, one by Daniel J. Bernstein, which is um, used by everything from Apple to OpenSSL and OpenSSH, and uh, ED25519 is very, very well respected in the cryptographic community. We also have proof of work security, and we're working on ways to reduce things like mining centralization, because that can also present a risk. And then we have a side, not a side project, but a project that's part of Monero called Covery, and Covery is an I2P router, so I2P is an alternative to Tor, except the focus of the I2P is mostly hidden services, so staying within the I2P network, within this layer, anonymous layer on top of the internet. And with Covery, once we eventually have it running smoothly and integrated with Monero, your transactions will be broadcast over I2P instead of being broadcast in the clear. And this just breaks the IP address linkage so no one can see that this IP address was the first node to broadcast a transaction. So if you want to get started with Monero, then there are a couple of things. There's the website, getmonero.org. We have command line tools, and the command line wallet is kind of the gold standard because it's the thing we work on. And uh, the GitHub repo is listed there. We have a web wallet or web wallet that I run called My Monero. Obviously, it's a web wallet. There are huge risks to using a web wallet. Please do not store more than you are willing to lose in a web wallet, including that one. And then graphical clients. So graphical clients have been a bit of a bone of contention because we've been focusing so much on the underlying technology that we kind of don't really care about putting out a GUI. Um, there is one called Light Wallet 2 that a community member has written, which is reasonable. And then we have... Um, our own GUI that we've been pecking away at for the past while, and that's starting to come together, and it's quite pretty. And then we also have um, Exodus. I don't know if anyone has seen the Exodus wallet. Um, it's a multi-currency wallet, and that uh, they've been working on adding support from an era now for a few weeks, and it's looking pretty good. Um, 
Of course, something that I do want to say is please exercise caution. Monero is still a work in progress. This is very difficult to, to do stuff and it's, stuff can break and stuff can be badly done and badly implemented. So exercise caution and don't, please don't let your life hang in the balance by using Monero just yet. Okay. So where to next? Because obviously there's other hard problems that we want to address with Monero. And some of the things that we want to try and tackle, things that um, we're not the only ones trying to tackle it, but this is stuff that we find interesting. Decentralized identity and trust. Being able to create anonymous throwaway identities and then build up trust relationships if you want to have them more long-lived. Private multi-party computations. So think Ethereum sort of style smart contracts. But instead of being executed by everyone all the time on every block, it's a multi-party computation that is executed privately. No one knows about it. Um, there's a, a white paper for something called Enigma, which is uh, uh, done by a bunch of people out of MIT. And that's kind of our focus of that. Enigma is really interesting. Um, additional privacy for the Lightning Network. The Lightning Network implementations that we've seen are really cool. But we think that we can add some additional privacy to it in the Monero implementation when we get there. And then sidechain-based tokens. So things like um, being able to issue assets and convert assets and sell assets in a sidechain or in a bunch of sidechains. Now, I've said a bunch of stuff and some people have understood all of it and some people have understood like a quarter and that's okay. I'm just some guy saying some stuff. How do you evaluate a system's claims? And this is kind of important because we're in a cryptocurrency world and yet very few of us are cryptographers. Very few of us even have the desire to go and study a bunch of maths, to go and understand whether someone's claim is valid. So how do you as ordinary individuals test the claims of me, test the claims of someone else's system? A couple of things that I like to suggest people do. Demand cryptographic proof. If someone says their system does X, Y, and Z, demand the cryptographic proof. Show me the research paper. Show me the white paper. That's the first step. Demand peer review. Now, peer review is really interesting because anyone can get peer reviewed. You just submit your, pa your um, paper to a journal. And if you're submitting your paper to the Journal of Medicine, you probably have a big problem because this is cryptography. So you should be submitting it to um, cryptography journals like PETS, the Privacy Enhancing Technology Symposium. There's a journal. Uh, Ledger is an upcoming crypt, uh, uh, cryptocurrency journal. And by submitting it, it gets peer-reviewed and published. And if it gets published in a journal, there's at least an additional level of like, okay, these claims are not complete nonsense. And finally, recognize hand-waving. Hand-waving is probably my pet hate. Because what happens is someone suggests something and they go, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we had three-second blocks? And you go, no, it wouldn't. That's idiotic for a number of reasons. And they go, no, it isn't. <laughs> and you go, yes, it is, because it's broken for the following reasons. And they go, don't worry. <laughs> we'll layer complexity. And complexity is the enemy of good security. Because if you have to layer this stuff on top to make it work, chances are it's broken somewhere. You just don't know about it. That's not to say that complex systems <coughs> shouldn't exist and complex systems are fine, but if you're layering complexity to deal with obvious brokenness, you're not fixing the brokenness. You're just layering a bunch of crud on and hoping no one notices. And that's all. So any questions, please feel free to email me or ask them now. <laughs>